So don't, don't be alarmed. Not say anything bad. <laughs> Where does the recording go? The recording goes on our YouTube channel, and I will also share it with you when it's over. If you would like, we usually make our recordings public. Um, if you would rather it be unlisted so that folks can only see it if they have the link to it already, that's totally fine with us too. No, Either one is okay. Absolutely fine. Just if it's public, then I can link it to um anything yeah. else that I'm doing. So that's really yeah. helpful. Absolutely. Um yeah. yeah. And we like to make it a resource that scholars can take advantage of um, you know, beyond the day of the event itself. Um, yeah. right, and, so. and we have a visual culture program um, playlist at the, at the library company. So it'll go into that playlist nice. um, as well with the other um, videos that we have related to the visual culture program. So good for me, Great. good for the visual culture program. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, Alice, just so you already uh, also know, um, typically what I try to do is um, tomorrow um, submit the paperwork for your honorarium. So you should hopefully be getting that in the next couple weeks. So if you're if you don't see if you're not seeing anything by the end of February, let me know so I can um, you know check. I have on. just heard from my research funding people um, that they would like me to use my personal bank details to receive the honorarium. Okay, all right. Than the institutional details that you'll have on file. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah. So if so you could give, it get me the a bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Do if you, you let me know what you will need from me, and I, yeah. I, I, I think I might need to do a tax form or something. Okay. So, yeah, the, so do you need to do the W nine instead of? I mean, so we also have like it's like I B. I'll send you the links for both. And <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. We have links um, to like a portal yeah. you can use and you can, yeah. yeah. You can figure out that. So um, what I'll do is I'll send you those links to the, I could potentially make a note to do that this um, afternoon. If I don't, it'll be um, by to. Oh, um, yeah, there's no, no rush, really no rush. Okay. Um, well, I want you to get paid, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so it's about um, 26. Yep. Yep. Um, and Alice, just to check, um, mm -hmm. is there anything, any links or anything that you would like me to share either in the chat during the event or after the event? Do you want me to link to your website or anything? Happy to, um, happy not to. I, I haven't prepared anything. I don't, I don't, not really. I mean, I could send you my institutional bio link that kind of has some stuff on there, but yeah I did would that be useful I can pop that in the chat I think it's okay since we're gonna read a bio for you already yeah um so I think it's fine it's not it's not a requirement by any means um okay. awesome um well why do folks feel like a two minute moment to use the bathroom get a snack drink some water would be helpful <laughs> I don't want us to miss our 130 but I also <laughs> if you need a second to step away please feel free that's fine. I'm, I'm ready. I've got my Coke. <laughs> Great. Ready for anything. Okay. All right. Well, so uh, let me just make sure I have all of the things up that I need to have up. I have not gotten any frantic emails from anyone saying they can't find the Zoom <laughs> link, so that's great. That's a relief. <laughs> and I think we had a pretty good registration number already a few weeks ago, so I'm yes. I, I haven't oh. checked. It's yeah, yes. it's good. <laughs> um, there has been a lot of interest in this talk, which is shared oh. by me because I always find comic Valentine images when I'm looking for event images. Uh, and I'm always like, what the heck is going what on? Is so I'm very idea? excited. They're well, it's wild. A slight, slight, really, I guess it's a slight survey. So a little bit of a kind of background on Valentine's and Valentine's culture and the sentimental examples and how they developed and then yeah. moving on to look at some of the comic examples amazing and well I, just, I find that, that interesting too so. yeah yeah no it, I'm yeah I'm so thank you so much again for participating um in thank you so much for talk and you know uh it, it's very fortuitous your topic and getting it scheduled like we did um, so yeah, uh, as uh, Allison was saying, a lot of interest. So this is good. <laughs> Will you let me know afterwards how many attended? Absolutely. Brilliant. Some academics really don't want to know. So usually I <laughs> err on the side of not sharing because people be get good nervous. To know afterwards. <laughs> After is a perfect. We can absolutely do that. Yeah. 
All right. Um, well, why don't we all go camera and video off in just a sec and I will turn <laughs> screen sharing on. Um, I'll turn the closed captions on and then it's 129 now. So in just a minute, I'll start letting folks in. Brilliant. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> See you on the other side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See you in a bit. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Erica Piola, Director of the Visual Culture Program, and I'm delighted to be the host of this afternoon's talk with Dr. Alice Grossley, our 2023-2024 William H. Halfand Fellow in American Visual Culture. Advantageous for us in the scheduling of her fellows talk, Alice's current project examines 19th century Valentines. With her presentation today, Love Me, Love Me Not, Emotion and Identity in 19th Century Valentines, Alice will explore these sentimental tokens for their visual, tactile, and emotional properties in conversation with their comic counterparts function as devices of malicious humor, similar to 21st century trolling. As described by Alice, less I love you than I love you not. But before we begin, I would like to note that today's talk is about 40 minutes and there will be time for questions and answers. So please place any queries in the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. I would also like to briefly introduce the library company and the visual culture program to those who may not be familiar with either. The library company was originally started in 1731 as a subscription library by then printer Benjamin Franklin and his discussion group, The Junto. Today, we are an independent research library for the study of American culture and history before the early 20th century. Our rich holdings include over 1 million books, graphics, ephemera, and art and artifacts and comprise subject strengths such as African-American history, women's history, and visual culture. 
The latter inspired the implementation of the Visual Culture Program with the mission to promote visual literacy through the creative use of historical visual materials and supports exhibitions, research fellowships, publications, acquisitions, digital projects, and public programs. The Visual Culture Program seeks to facilitate talks such as today that confront, explore, and complicate the social construction of what we see, how we see it, and why we see it as we do in our understanding of the mass visual culture of the nation before 1950. Relatedly, I also wanted to quickly mention that although the deadline for the applications for the 2024-2025 William H. Helfand Fellowship in American Visual Culture is soon to pass, I hope some of you in the audience will apply next year. Please see the chat for the link to the information page. And with that said, this afternoon, we are most fortunate to have Alice join us and to learn about what she discovered in the Library Company's collection of Valentines in support of her visual and material study of these ephemeral objects. One cannot help but take to one's heart and head these innately engaging pieces and our understanding of their continual resonance as tokens representative of the sociopolitics of human feelings, understanding, and bias. Now, as with great, great pleasure, I introduce Alice Crothley, who is Senior Lecturer in English Literature at the University of London, as well as a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and Secretary of the British Association for Victorian Studies. She has published on Valentine's, and as mentioned earlier, she is currently working on a book examining them through the lens of material and visual cultures, as well as effect and emotion and identity construction. She also writes extensively on age and masculinity in Victorian literature, as well as edits journal special issues on aging, including age, culture, humanities, and 19th century gender studies. She's author of Male Adolescence in Victorian Fiction and recent articles for Poetics Today, 19, and Yearbook of English Studies. Dr. Crossley's work has been supported through fellowships from not only the Library Company, but also the American Antiquarian Society and Winterthur Garden Museum and Library. Thank you again for talking with us this afternoon, Alice, and the screen is now yours. Thank you. So I will share screen. Okay, so um, I'd like to express my gratitude to start with to Erica and the Graphic Arts Department and the Visual Culture Programme at the Library Company for supporting my recent fellowship and inviting me to speak today. And thanks as well to Christine and Fran for overseeing my fellowship during the summer and my stay at Cassatt House and all the wonderful fellows that I met during my stay, as well as Alison for overseeing the tech today. I'd like to preface my talk by just letting you know in advance that it will contain offensive language, problematic stereotypes, and the mention of suicide, all of which are represented in some of the materials that I'll be discussing. Valentines are ostensibly mundane objects, simple ephemeral paper artifacts, often comprising a decorative front with scraps attached, a poetic verse or motto, to express affection and regard. And they're designed explicitly to perform as statements of emotional attachment in the 19th century. They're examples of what is usually called ephemera, defined by Christopher Makepeace as a flimsy or insubstantial transient document produced for a specific purpose and not intended to survive the topicality of its message or event to which it relates. However, while many Valentines are fragile transient documents of the past in one sense, they were often also designed to be displayed or retained as personal keepsakes, both transient and yet commemorative and meaningful beyond the day or even the year in which they were exchanged. These cards circulate within their historical moment as social objects, incorporating visual, textual and tactile qualities and as such, they operate in conjunction with wider discourses about personal intimate things that hold meaning through their materiality as much as their symbolic or metaphorical potential. These objects, which sit alongside comparable ephemera, especially exchange cards, trade cards, greetings cards, calling cards, rewards of merit and flirtational escort cards, also participate in discourses of identity construction speaking variously to debates about gender roles, national culture and historical events such as the Civil War, 
race, class and sexuality, often rooted through assumptions about respectability and moral conformity, belonging and difference. As such, Valentines are what Jennifer Black has termed communicative objects that rely on a shared set of cultural values, primarily those established by the white middle classes. As well as considering these cards as highly decorative graphic objects and complex contributors in a wider matrix of transatlantic 19th century material and visual cultures, in my research, I'm interested in exploring the Valentine's function as a cultural index, an indicator of social status, and a material site that traces the interplay of identity, embodiment, and affect. This talk today touches on these topics, focusing on some of the Library Company of Philadelphia's extensive archive of Valentines, and especially the comic type in the McAllister and Helfand collections alongside a few other examples from a few repositories such as Winterter, the American Antiquarian Society, and one or two from this side of the Atlantic. In the first decades of the 1800s, commercial valentines largely took the form of printed or collaged paper-based cards, often with the addition of hand embellishment. With roots in early 19th century Europe, they were cemented as part of both British and American cultures by the 1840s, operating in a wider context of greetings card production, as developments in technology led to greater intricacies in their material form. As Barry Shank has suggested, 19th century Valentines can help us see the complex structures of feeling that connected private emotional life and public business at this crucial moment in the development of commercial society. Attitudes towards the sale and circulation of Valentine's cards, however, ranged from a celebration of their innovation, from their use of lace paper to chromolithographic printing techniques and playful mimicry of legal documents and even money, as with this example here of a banknote Valentine printed by McGee. In Britain, uh, these were supposedly so realistic that they had to be uh, uh, withdrawn. <laughs> People tried to cash them. Um, and then to anxieties about their status as mass produced commodities, not least what was seen as their trivializing and cheapening of emotional expression, according to some commentators. Sentimental Valentines, especially those with personal inscription, signal the emotional weight labor with which these cards are usually associated as expressions of love, longing, tenderness, and friendship. Comic or vinegar Valentines, by contrast, subvert the conventional association of Valentines with warmth and fond regard. Instead, those variants encode revulsion and resentment, disapproval and dislike and their receipt could provoke such a strong response that, as was reported in newspapers, comic valentines were even cited in cases of domestic violence and suicide. This talk will look at examples of valentines designed, manufactured or sent during the 19th century, shown here in order to illustrate a type or to demonstrate how they functioned as forms of communication and expressions of sentiment as they're calculated to convey or provoke intense emotion, I suggest that they're uniquely placed among greeting cards and graphic ephemera to elucidate social attitudes. Such ephemeral objects function, as Jim Muscle argues, as a metonym for what we have forgotten. Valentines, like other ephemera, offer clues to past attitudes about cultural values, social and interpersonal dynamics, and they re-emerge as documents that speak backwards to networks of feeling in the 19th century. So Valentines are associated primarily with courtship and romance, as evidenced in their imagery and their textual effusions. They could also, however, be sent to friends and family members. In the first half of the 1800s, 
when they became commercial mass produced commodities rather than almost exclusively manuscript objects, Valentines largely take the form of printed or collaged paper based cards, often with hand embellishment. The earliest examples contain images and designs in simple lithography or woodcut with a splash of hand painted colour. The visual motifs of these valentines might now be considered fairly conventional to us, and they're likely to include, um, as we see with the first image here, symbolic flowers, ferns or weeping willows, cupids, suggestive church steeples in the background, uh, altars, lovers standing hand clasped, bleeding hearts, pairs of birds or nesti uh, nesting birds, butterflies, wreaths and waterfalls. Um, as you can see, quite a lot of that is contained in this single example here. This series of popular visual motifs relating to the day presented people increasingly with the opportunities to express love and affection, but almost by rote, according to the popular imagery enshrined and perpetuated on the manufactured cards. More costly, elaborate examples became more common by mid-century. And these often highly ornamental valentines were typically mounted on embossed or laced paper with elaborate borders, inscribed or affixed mottos, and folded leaves of decorated paper, which might open to reveal further designs, layers, messages, and images beneath, as we have with this example um, here on the right. Many of these cards were embellished with the addition of paper scraps of the kind that were used for scrap albums and could be sold in sheets. Mottos were also sold, and these might be short verses, pithy statements or single words such as sincerity, affection or constancy to assert the tone of the sender's feelings. Um, and the central image here is an example of um, kind of wafers uh, or, or that could be used as mottos. The manufacturer of Valentine's rested on a collaborative effort between the stationer, who was usually the designer, an artist who provided illustrations, but those weren't typically produced in house, and the printer or workers, often women, who would apply the decorative elements. These images here from a card design held at the John Johnson collection at the Bodleian Library show how the process was conducted from the initial idea with a rhyme set out to an accompanying sketch, a second version in which the image is perfected and finalized, and then the final iteration, uh, of which the stationer here has noted in the top right-hand corner, 200 were printed. The stationer's notes on these stock cards are invaluable in considering trends and popularity. So which type of card endured year, year after year, and also it speaks to the processes of production and assembly. Here, some American examples by the New York firm of Slater show the changes that were made by the stationer in handwritten notes. So in other words, um, what we can see here are the annotations that they are to be printed in color. Um, we have a change in title here, uh, the numbers that would be printed per choir, so per, um, per stack of paper, and a change that was made to the stationer's address when they moved. These cards are redolent of the invisible historical hand that crafted or collaged the object, their construction revealing how the reshaping of materials may produce new meaning in a process of bricolage or papier collé. This example here shows an embossed gilded valentine in Minnie Campbell Wilson's scrapbook. Here, the valentine on the top left of the album page is just one part of a whole collection of materials arranged to articulate personal expression and aesthetic taste. This illustrates what Patricia Di Bello terms feminine forms of image making and collecting. Through its rearrangement, the Valentine's meaning is transformed from its original iteration as perhaps a memorandum of affection between two individuals to part of a larger collection of sentimental and perhaps gendered visual material and social ephemera as part of this scrap album. 
As Ellen Gruber Garvey has noted, scrapbooks not only allowed readers to save, manage and reprocess information, but people in positions of relative powerlessness use their scrapbooks to make a place for themselves and their community by finding, sifting, analysing and recirculating writing that mattered to them. In the scrap albums held at the library company, several included greetings cards, including Valentine's, as part of the mass of material pasted inside. Such cards become divorced from their original context in this way, and as uh, originally a standalone object that telegraph a single moment, event, or affective relationship. They are here recombined according to the owner's curatorial imp impulse, and the visual material processes of memory making within the leaves of an album in the manner of an anthology, a piecemeal that reunited into a different format is creatively reimagined through new form and spatial arrangement. While Valentine's in scrap albums sometimes may have a note next to them, indicating from whom they are received, individual items also offered an opportunity for personalization with specific details about the addressee, if accompanied by an envelope, or a written message inside or to the rear, perhaps a name or a poem. Sally Holloway has reflected on the act of adding a personal inscription to commercial printed ephemera such as Valentine's. She reminds us that writing over a consumer object such as a printed Valentine card actively changed the meaning of the object through the addition of handwriting and personal sentiments that made the card unique to the sender. The result is a multi-layered pastiche or bricolage of romantic messages. The imprint of a writer's hand worked to make the Valentine personal and emotionally valuable. Um, and this is an example um, here of the significance that envelopes can hold um, when they accompany their Valentines. Um, uh, here we have a, a Valentine to Maria French, um, and this is a cobweb Valentine. So um, you can see that this is uh, designed to be lifted. Um, and uh, Nancy Rosen has uh, talked about an example of a um, Romeo and Juliet envelope that was sent to a Maria French. And, and I'm wondering whether this may be the same Maria French um, given the address. <laughs> the excessive language of sentimental Valentines was also employed in the overblown rhetoric of sellers advertisements. An advertisement for the Philadelphia and New York stationers, Turner and Fisher, assures potential buyers that their wares will incite passion in the recipient and secure reciprocal love from their target. They offer palpitations of the heart, cured at the shortest notice, an aching void plugged up with the utmost dispatch, proud maidens rendered soft and tender on reasonable terms, skittish young widows melted down and rendered docile and affectionate at the lowest price and without any loss of time. And this indicates the playfulness of both the Valentines themselves and the stationers' sales strategies in a competitive market. A trade publication for the New York firm of Strong also reassures potential retailers that even their comic offerings will not be unduly crude or vulgar, not the reader is assured like the pesky English examples. Uh, it reads, great care has been taken in the manufacture and especially in the selection of Valentines, not to give offence to the most scrupulous delicacy. This care and selection has been necessary, especially in respect to the English Valentines, which are not always so delicate as our more fastidious ideas of propriety require, uh, which suggests, I think, an interesting point of comparison uh, for British and Amer American examples. Richard McGee is another significant producer, wholesaler and retailer of Valentine's in Philadelphia at mid-century, who advertised extensively. In the newspaper, The Public Ledger in February 1851, McGee advertised its wares strenuously, inviting people to visit his great Valiant Valentine manufactory, claiming the originality of both his store's wares and its advertisements as well. And this is not pictured, but I quote uh, from 
uh, that from a piece. Um, he says, originality. How could it be expected that other Valentine sellers who are obliged to copy or rather filch even the wording of their advertisements, as may be seen by yesterday's ledger, from McGee's announcements can, can, can compare with him who is the most extensive Valentine manufacturer in the United States and offers nothing that is not original. And this image on the right shows a later McGee advertisement for his Valentines of every sort. However, his ad from which I quoted made a pointed dig at other significant Valentine's stationers in the city at the time, Fisher and Brothers, whose extensive advertisements can be found alongside McGee's on the same page of newsprint. This is shown here on the left. Um, while McGee expresses his public irritation at the Fisher Brothers muscling in on his advertising techniques in the ledger, the Fishers worked hard to seduce the public into purchasing their wares, and they developed a canny line in advertising their products. In the same copy of the ledger, below McGee's advertisement, they also claim originality in their St. Valentine's headquarters of love, love hope and affection, uh, saying, we call ourselves the only extensive manufacturers of Valentine's in Philadelphia. So it was very competitive. Uh, but they also go on to draw on current events to catch the reader's attention. On the same page, pictured here, additional advertisements reflect on who will be the next president, imminent civil war, the California gold rush, the forthcoming World's Fair in London, P.T. Barnum's auction of the first ticket to Jenny Lynn's concert, and use it, they use these topical events to grab the reader's attention. As much as the Valentines themselves then, the mode of promotion and advertisement also speaks to the strategies and culture of Valentine's production, pr production at mid-century, drawing on playful as well as sentimental rhetoric uh, rep represented in the cards. And now I'm going to turn to the salty Valentine. Gaining popularity by the 1840s and notable for their surprisingly malicious humor, Commercially produced comic Valentines deployed strategies like 21st century trolling, the act of posting inflammatory, deliberately provocative messages online to bully and to stir up others into incendiary emotional responses. Rather than expressing fond regard, these Valentines were satirical, mocking and rude, revealing the Valentines subversive potential. Comic Valentines articulated prejudice through the guise of humour. The cruel mockery found targets in the appearance, trade, age, race or perceived character deficiency of the unfortunate addressee and were cheaply produced, usually on a single sheet of paper. These are a type of Valentine that explore a range of negative affectivity or aversive emotional states, which could be bracketed under what Sylvan Tompkins terms the affect of shame humiliation, a collective umbrella for shyness, shame, guilt, and contempt. They express feelings of disgust or, disgust or hatred and range from the expression of mild irritation to extreme dislike. As with these examples, um, they certainly didn't pull any punches. Um, this is an example here that invites the unfortunate subject to take his own life. Uh, stationers produced popular Valentines, which were, uh, uh, these are some examples, meant to be sent to women who, as the phrase went, wore the trousers, who were seen as too domineering or who, God forbid, wanted the right to vote. Uh, as we see here on, on the right. And they were also designed for dandified men who were too foppish or seen as effeminate, as with, um, oh no, sorry, not this example. Um, the previous example, there we go, sorry, there, um, the would-be woman. Um, or people who were too slovenly or stingy or uh, frankly ugly um, is often used. These crude, vulgar variants were calculated to provoke laughter, 
as sources of humor in which the means of derision was usually a cruel caricature of the recipient. Both their visual and textual components often prioritize the, hyper, the hyperbolized body represented through physiognomic distortion and exaggeration. As Barry Shank suggests, comic valentines expose the seams in the social fabric. And Annabella Pollen has similarly recognized that they employed laughter as a weapon. Comic valentines thus speak to processes of culturally sanctioned disavowal, largely aimed at marginalized groups. They cultivate a rhetoric and visual index of disgust, revulsion and resentment using the medium's graphic and textual conditions to make a spectacle of bodies and minds which do not conform to cultural norms and expectations. In doing so, they rehearse a type of dominance over those considered ideologically other or socially inferior. They found a rich target in aging bachelors and old maids, as with this example, uh, and they could even be used for cuckolds, uh, for men who abused their wives and husbands who cheated on their wives or didn't provide adequate financial support for their children. Although these latter types are um, seem to be more frequent in British archives, but here are some examples. Um, this example draws attention uh, to the recipient's advanced age, identifying her as cross, ugly and a scold because she is an old maid, combining both gender and age discrimination. In the second example, which combines temperament and physical appearance as the topic of moral censure, we have the designation fat, fair and lazy. These valentines thus use the medium's conditions to make a spectacle um, of those, um, of those considered ideologically inferior by adopting at least a temporary position of superiority. These comic variants could thus be a source of apparent hilarity for the sender at least, and could be a cheeky joke shared between friends, but they could also provoke resentment, anger, hurt, anxiety, and real grief, as one might expect the recipients of these examples to feel. Uh, Valentine's uh, extracts here from Valentine's uh, to a loathsome creature, a hateful man, and president of the Ugly Club. These Valentines often exhibit racist stereotypes as well, transforming the individual into an object of a fetishizing gaze, which removed agency and reproduced race through a harmful, exploitative visual lens. The American comic Valentine on the left shows a white unionist soldier kissing an African-American woman with a verse reading, you nasty black Republican to hug the sooty African, such a filthy kin to swine shall never be my Valentine. And the card perpetuates harmful rhetoric and cultural attitudes about racial hierarchies, illustrating as well the conflict of civil war politics, together with the one on the right, which reflects satirically on double standards and injustice. Unsurprisingly, the receipt of such a mocking Valentine was likely to be met with consternation, especially as many were sent anonymously. And this is the subject of a jest um, in this print taken from the series Life in Philadelphia. Comic Valentines also use their particular brand of satirical humor to poke fun at non-normative physicalities in which categories of physical appearance are understood as a shorthand for moral or even mental deficiency, expressing, uh, sorry, yeah. In doing so, I suggest that comic Valentines adopt iconographic and rhetorical strategies to effectively infreak their intended recipient. They rehearse what disability studies scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson recognizes as a process which pathologizes the extraordinary body set against a privileged norm. The imagined deviant non-normative or disabled body is in comic Valentines problematically constructed as grotesque. It's conceived as imperfect, lacking, excessive, damaged or monstrous. 
Valentine's draw on the rhetoric and representation of the extraordinary body as a figure of otherness set implicitly against that privileged norm. And they can provide a literalized index of an individual's character flaws or behavioral transgressions through physical manifestation, using techniques of hyperbole and parody to reveal outlandish caricatures of, in which body parts balloon in size, shrink, are distorted, or replaced with animal or mechanical features like prostheses. These types of card relish the visual and verbal rhetoric of freakdom in their portrayal of non-normative bodies, encoded as simultaneously too much and not enough. Both the visual and textual elements of such cards echo the strategies used by the showman and traveling circus manager P.T. Barnum, who notoriously displayed so-called freaks and human oddities in his museum as a form of spectacle. And these similarities are evident here in these series of Valentines, which echo the ways in which one of Barnum's star attractions, William Henry Johnson, was touted as a microcephalic pinhead or what is it, the what is it. The language of disability in visual and textual tropes is thus appropriated in the comic Valentine I'm suggesting as a means of social disavowal using physical differences in size, shape or arrangement, or even perceived cognitive incapacity and neuroatypicality to double down on the conception of non-normative embodiment as spectacle. Not only do these Valentines stigmatize and degrade multiple forms of physical difference, they also deliberately cultivate disability as a humiliation attaching moral ignominy to various forms of physical difference by using disability as a casual slur to abjure the targeted subject. Transspecies hybridity, combining animal and human body parts, was popular in comic valentines, and this resonates with the ways in which animals are often used in satirical prints and caricatures, in newspaper illustration, for example, and political cartoons. Um, and viewing these as proxies for human traits. This kind of imagery offers, in Christine Ferguson's terms, the spectacular frisson of hybridity. The individual is imb imbued with the stereotypical qualities of the animal, in indicating some kind of bestial, often atavistic, uncivilized propensity in the image's subject. It's perhaps unsurprising that comic valentines are less common generally in archives, and those that are collected are often samples of stationer's stock. I'm not sure I would have felt inclined to treasure one either if I'd received a cruel jab like those that I've shown. But as fun curiosities, they still occasionally find a place in collections, as with the extensive collection at the library company. And they can also be found in repositories such as scrap albums alongside other types of printed matter, um, which is the case with this especially dense example here, which has pages and pages of printed matter, including numerous comic valentines, um, some with brief inscriptions. As well as a brisk trade in commercial Valentine cards, from the 18th century emerged a parallel, less decorative type of printed ephemera, the Valentine Writer, a small book or pamphlet containing rhymes and pleasantries designed for those who could not or chose not to furnish their own verses. They came in both sentimental and comic varieties, much like the Valentines themselves. Valentine writers perhaps should be considered as crucial participants in 19th century discourses about questions of originality, value, authenticity, and taste. Although they're often overlooked and overshadowed by the more graphic material interest represented by the cards themselves. As pamphlets containing rhymes, quotations, and riddles, the Valentine writer offered a convenient alternative to and less pressure than writing one's own Valentine message. Its verses could be copied out by hand, providing a level of personalization and intimacy that commercial versions might lack, Valentines might lack. And if, as Mike Chasar contends, love is Valentine's, Valentine, Valentine's Day's capital, 
then I suggest that the Valentine writer plays an important role in democratizing access to that capital by providing neat, ready-made articulations of feeling. However, they can also function um, uh, to manufacture facsimile emotion, thus extending concerns about authenticity. Um, so to conclude briefly, as an object in itself, a Valentine card might initially appear to be fairly unremarkable. Um, a seasonal expression of regard for another, a pretty decorative relic of the past. They remain fascinating for their materiality, their tactile, even interactive makeup, and are ripe for reading the traces of the past, for their social dynamics and for their articulations of feeling. But as the wide range of examples provided here have demonstrated, the Valentine provokes questions about sincerity, authenticity, intent and humour. In comic versions, their subversion is often a way of reasserting the status quo, and they largely centre the heteronormative middle class white individual. While the Valentine remains a quasi-ephemeral object, what collectors sometimes refer to as fugitive or gray material, such objects were often treasured for their personal value. Um, it's been a real privilege to have the opportunity to consult the library company's archives, um, not least to uncover some of these bizarre, if uncomfortable, examples of comic Valentines. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'm very happy to take any questions. I will just uh, stop sharing my screen. I'm joining you. Oh, <laughs> I was like having a little trouble there with the, uh, the uh, undo my, or to show my video there, but here I am. <laughs> Alice, thank you so much for that really fabulous um, talk. Um, so what I'm gonna do is um, to, you know, as people are, are uh, digesting and, and, and having, um, coming up with um, questions I was gonna ask you, uh, I was gonna indulge myself if I, you could answer a, a question that I have. Um, and I was thinking about, which we discussed a little bit before um, your talk about uh, you um, getting to um, research uh, these comic Valentines, like your your process and your route to getting to them. Like, did you know about them before you started your work with the the sentimental Valentines, or um, you know you knew about the sentimental Valentines and you know that um, got you to the the comic? And also, if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the quote that you had about like, oh, the English uh, comic Valentine's, you know, just so, um, you know, um, that we're too delicate here <laughs> in, in the United States <laughs> to bear witness. And so Strong was going to have, uh, you know, more appropriate comic Valentine. So if you don't mind um, talking a little bit about that, and then we do have some questions coming in and I'll go to the questions coming in. Yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of my journey to these materials, I suspect it would be like most people who are interested in, in 19th century Valentine's. Um, which was through the sentimental um, in themselves. They are um, they they range from you know fairly simple but quite beautiful pieces to incredibly ornate, wonderfully rich, um, very three dimensional, very tactile, very interactive pieces. Um, and some of the examples that I found of the sentimental type have been um, lovely, really um, embedding in the history of this as a kind of courtship ritual. So sometimes these sentimental examples have been um, effectively proposals. Um, one notable example is at the Museum of London, where uh, the stationer Jonathan King uh, proposed to his uh, wife with this wonderful kind of thick book of Valentines. Um, so by looking at those sentimental examples, I then came across um, these, you know, the, the cartoons, the, the caricatures that you see, um, and was so surprised that these are, are the opposite end of the spectrum um, in terms of the materials, in terms of, um, in terms of the kind of sentiments and messages that they convey. Um, and I think I was also particularly interested reading about people's responses uh, to the circulation of uh, an in increasing popularity, especially in America by the end of the 19th century um, of comic variants, 
um, and the way in which in you know each year newspapers uh, would be up in arms about uh, the, the problems involved in the sale of comic valentines. Uh, some people refused to accept any post on the 14th of February just in case they had one. Um, and in, in Britain, the, the, um, before the, the use of um, standardised post, you'd have to pay to receive uh, your post, which might include one of these awful variants. Um, so that, I guess, was my you know, how I came to uh, the project. In terms of some of the distinctions between uh, American and British Valentines, um, the, the history of it as a commercial enterprise um, begins in Britain a little bit earlier than it does in America. And then uh, America begins with uh, Valentines as imports uh, from Britain and then swiftly develops its own um, uh, it, 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 its own. Um, uh, industry, Valentine's industry with um, Esther Howland and George Whitney and a whole host then of other um, other stationers as well, who, um, who as some of those examples showed, I think are increasingly um, innovative in the ways in which they chose to advertise their wares. The comic variations I think are interesting because they are, they remain popular in America for much, much longer than they do in Britain. Uh, by the end of the 19th century in Britain, they are they're really on the decrease um they're much less popular but they they go well into the 20th century um in the united states yeah i was gonna say i know we have a few early 20th century in the library companies collection i know you you, you saw some of them yeah. and um, yeah. i think like in science we've been in our research file of a scientific i think it's an american article about you know valentine still early um 20th century but let me I'm, I'm digressing i have several questions um for you um so let me i'm gonna try to go in um in the order that they were received but i might jump mm -hmm. around a little bit um first question is i'd be interested in what information you've uncovered if any about the women who did the hand painting of some of these valentines including the instructions they received, their payment, working conditions, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, um, one of my previous fellowships was at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, uh, which was historically a kind of base, a home for the American Valentine. Um, and uh, I think Esther Howland was kind of seen as the, the, the mother of the American Valentine. Um, and they, there are some interesting um, photographs um, of the kind of attic workroom uh, where she had set herself up. Um, this was very much a kind of domestic enterprise from her home, at least initially. Um, this obviously then, uh, as this would take off, I think it became um, uh, a much, much bigger enterprise. Um, as with, for example, the Whitney Company, um, who, um, who had, I think, a couple of warehouses, which then in the 20th century, unfortunately burned down. Um, and the Worcester Historical Museum has um, an, a sort of album of the photographs of the, um, uh, of the damage that the fire did and the rooms stacked high with paper. Um, there's also a very um, interesting uh, kind of uh, humorous article um, called Cupid's Manufactory um, in one of uh, Dickens's magazines, uh, periodicals, um, which talks about um, uh, the writer's experience of going into um, one of the um, kind of, the, it's called Cupid's Manufactory, um, and talks about the process by which the Valentines were made, which was um, kind of like a, a conveyor belt system. Um, so uh, the workers um, who, articles tend to say were primarily women, um, would be instructed um, how to arrange various materials, perhaps by color or by type. Um, and they would kind of do their bit and then pass it on. So it seems that typically one person wouldn't create a Valentine in its entirety, but the various pieces of lace or scrap or um, other items that were going to be affixed or the um, application of colors would be done by individuals and then kind of passed along. Um, Yes, I think it's an interesting process. So it seems to have kind of initially started as, as quite a domestic, um, a domestic process, especially in the smaller scale. Um, but then uh, later in the century, um, especially for comic variants, um, there are particular artists uh, who are, are, are very well known for their comic imagery, um, like, uh, Charles 
oh, I want to say Howland because I've just said it. It's Charles Howard, Charles Lee Howard. <laughs> um, and with the very typical H that you see in a lot, he was incredibly prolific and and, and kind of had a, a relationship through um, McLaughlin to uh, a particular writer, and they kind of seemed to work quite closely together. There was a um, an interesting article that I came across actually during my time at the library company, which talked about the relationship between these two men. Um, so while it seems to have been initially women working on Valentines, I, I don't think that was the case. Um, even I suppose really by kind of mid century. Thank you. Questions are coming in. Um, so uh, this is a question I, I might be able to answer it as well, but I, I will address it um, to, to you, um, Alice. Um, thank you for your fascinating presentation. What are the challenges in maintaining and preserving these ephemera? Oh, um, I, I mean, I think this is a, a curatorial question. Um, so Erica, I think you you will uh, have more to say because you, you are doing that work um, of preservation. I think part of the difficulties that I, I notice as a researcher are um, when Valentines had been um, pasted onto a background, um, especially in an album um, and have then been detached um, and that can sometimes um, uh, lead to problems. I suppose there's also as well just the, the delicate nature of the material often means that um, these are objects that will tend to be placed in kind of in mylar in, 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 um, uh, in sort of plastic pockets uh, to try and protect them. The difficulty of course with that is um, that you only really get to see the front of the object or, or the or the back rather than the inside. And sometimes the inside or the back um, is typically where you'll get any inscription. Um, so that's typically where you'll have any uh, a sense of who it might be to, who it might be from, um, which is obviously an important part of what you, you're trying to consider as a researcher. I don't know, Erica, if you've got anything to add there. Yeah, just to add a little bit to what um, Alice was saying. So, you know, she was mentioning mylar sleeves, but also we use um, acid-free um, inserts or sometimes um, folders uh, might make more sense if it's a, you know, multi-layered um, um, valentine or sometimes um, our conservation staff has um, created, I, I'm not going to use the right terminology, but it's um, like a cardboard thing with like a recess where like, you know, if something has multiple layers, it kind of sits in there and it has a nice cover to it. So it's not going to get smushed to some <laughs> very technical term in, in, in a box, um, or as Alice was uh, mentioning, um, sometimes we'll make um, photocopies of the back that we'll put um, on the mm -hmm. other side of the the um, insert so individuals don't necessarily have to, to flip the material, but we're always, um, you know, as, as curators, we always, we can take things out for individuals and, you know, manipulate them as, as necessary um, so that they can see the, the, the fullness of the item itself. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, thank you, um, Alice. Let me um, continue on. I'm, I think I'm going to try and combine um, a couple um, questions mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, work together. Um, this, um, Intendi had a question, which I think you um, answered um, in um, with, with your first answer. You know, when did the comic Valentines die out, and why? I think you kind of, you've addressed that. And then it was, um, and do you see any similarities between today's Valentines and the nineteenth century ones in terms of materiality and language? And a somewhat sil um, similar um, question to the first one I um, posed is, um, can, can you go into more detail about differences, similarities you noticed in U.S. versus U.K., especially in terms of race and abolition? Thank you for a fantastic talk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think in terms of those uh, those sort of national differences, um, one of the most obvious things immediately, and this is especially the case with the comic variants, uh, is the emphasis on race. Um, this is much less common um, in British Valentines. There are examples, um, but they, they just aren't as common. Um, the other thing as well is the kind of... Um, Key historical events in the 19th century uh, become um, a topic of, of uh, for Valentines. And really here I'm thinking about um, the Civil War. Uh, so there, there is a whole line of Civil War Valentines. Um, and I mentioned uh, Nancy Rosen, who, who is an extensive collector, um, who has written about um, examples of Civil War Valentines. Um, with, there's a copy of that in the library company. Um, and um, I think I might have missed out the first part of the question. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Erica. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, like, a quick 
quickly. Um, uh, changes, uh, um, why and oh, any similarities between the materiality and, and language to today um i mean we've inherited a lot of what the victorians established um especially in terms of iconography so the use of that um that kind of symmetrical heart um is really cemented by the 19th century even though in early 19th century uh valentines you do sometimes get literal hearts sort of like you know muscle with tubes coming off which i think is interesting um so yes yeah, so certainly in terms of iconography um I mean, one of the things that really does resonate to, with today's culture, less in terms of cards, um, is the use of um, uh, what used to be called rebus valentines, where an image is used as a um, as a code for a particular word. Um, so, kind of, uh, you know, I with an I, love, heart, you. Uh, so, um, which really reminds me a bit of kind of text speak and emojis um which i think is nice um i mean one thing that i think has increasingly happened over the last few decades is that there is a return not i think to the kind of comic valentines and the i think the severity um of uh some of them especially in terms of um you know identity characteristics and things like that um but the tone of recent valentines has become a little bit more um, pushing boundaries a bit more risque a bit more um, a bit more mm, I suppose light-hearted uh, really a bit more humorous um, as well as the, that kind of still use of sentimental language. So that just reminds that there's a local bakery here in Philadelphia which I know it's not uh, a valentine card but you know basically like we'll make any kind of like cakes cookies whatever message you want to send and it's you know <laughs> <laughs> not always the most genteel of messages but anyway um i also just wanted to mention since you were mentioning um nancy rosen um, uh, nancy was attending the talk and did um leave a message in the q a that um, mariah french that is the same address on her romeo and juliet yes. um, envelope oh, so oh no i'm, I'm so glad to know that as well so in terms of you know for what's in our um, um collection at the library company but i'm gonna um triple up um a question because they're they're mm -hmm. very um similar so hopefully i'll will be better about remembering them all um so the question are um to what extent were the gender roles in the sending and receiving of these valentines uh were valentines mostly sent from men um to women um and, and noticing that recipients of some comic valentines were addressed to men i'm wondering if sent as jokes by other men i also have the, a couple of suggestive postcards from uh, circa 1900 circa 1920 those um often have comments and joking on the postcard um, message side mm. so the gender um aspect in the receiving and um yeah. sending Ab yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really good question. Um, we, I think, will tend to think of uh, Valentine's now um, as perhaps more associated with the feminine in terms of, um, in terms of perhaps um, thinking about women as the buyers and senders, perhaps. Um, but certainly early in the center, sorry, early in the Victorian period, so mid-century. Um, these are cards that are intended to be purchased and sent uh, by both men and women. Um, and um, I, I think that that association, association with Valentine's is, is more of a kind of female enterprise, um, perhaps is something that comes later um, there certainly were cards that I found that are designed to be shared by friends. Um, I found I found some that were set de clearly designed to be sent from one man to another man, um, kind of joking about making making an ass of you and an ass of me um, is one particular example. Um, but you'd certainly see examples that are sent between friends um, and also within families as well. Um, Valentine's in the 19th century initially may have been about courtship ritual um but by mid-century that that seems to um have dropped and this is much more an opportunity to just express um express your regard especially the sentimental ones express your regard to family members to friends um and the postcards um, early in the 20th century certainly are a, a kind of legacy of the 19th century um 
uh, greetings card style um, of the majority of Valentines. Um, and you see, especially with the, um, the comic type, uh, a lot of them kind of almost move to the postcard, um, even though some are still available in that kind of single sheet format. Thank you, Alice. Um, and again, um, we, uh, I think you just addressed this question. There was a question about uh, uh, whether people were more likely to send comic valentines as insults or if they were often a joke, both the sender and receiver would find funny. I think you just ad um, addressed that. Um, and you're also getting a little bit into um, not only the um, sort of, uh, I guess, like the ages of, of individuals who might um, be receiving and distributing. So there was a question about would children receive and distribute valentines in this time period, which if you could touch a little bit more about um, that. Mm -hmm. And then another question about, um, well, this might be a little very broad, uh, but maybe you can do briefly. Um, was there any aspect you could not address due to time that you could share briefly, which I think you're doing with answering all these um, <laughs> questions. So we um, got, um, and just so, I mean, it's about 2.29. I hope some folks can stay a little bit later than um, 2.30 because I got some other um, questions um, coming in, but if you need to leave, um, we completely understand. So Alice, to you. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, Valentine's uh, were very popular for children. Um, by the late 19th century, children become one of the um uh one of the key intended recipients as, as a group. Um Valentines uh begin to feature children um in graphic representation. Um they use child figures um as a way of discussing um discussing emotion um, and affection um, in kind of quite a, a, what I suppose is seen as a sort of sweet, innocent way. Um, but certainly I've seen lots of examples where it, it seems very likely that um, children are exchanging these cards as well. Certainly when I was at the American Antiquarian Society, um, there was a series of Valentines that were um, uh, given by um, given to a young boy by his aunt, um, and it was clearly part of a collection. There, there were kind of several multiple versions of these, so they have I think been sent uh, year after year. Um, in the library company, um, in that uh, wonderful scrap album that I showed very briefly uh, towards the end, uh, with all of those comic versions in, there are numerous names inscribed um, uh, on those valentines. It's sort of in partial there's lots of um uh lots of initials um and a few names i think maybe hattie or something and in the american antiquarian society there was also a series of valentines again comic valentines that had clearly been sent and sent back uh to brothers and sisters and this was a, a family a family based in st louis i managed to actually identify them and to work out that actually all of these names are they're a sibling group um, but they had multiple names on, so it looked like they would yet yeah, receive it and then send it back. So children do become a very important part, I think, of that, that the kind of the culture of Valentine giving um, and receipt. Mm. Thank you, Alice. I'm just trying to moderate here. <laughs> um, so again, sort of um, doubling up on um, some questions. Um, and again, I think you've addressed these a little bit, but um, were these Valentines tending more toward postcards or folded, uh, folded cards? Um, what types of paper were used and where was this paper source? Were all Valentines on paper or were some on textiles fabric? And I know uh, another attending mentioned that some were just on, you know, the pulp paper that, you know, kind of really that that cheaper paper. Um, so if you could uh, talk a little bit about that material, material aspect. Um, of, of um, Valentine's. So in, in material terms, the comic variants uh, do, they tend to be uh, uh, on uh, cheap paper. Um, they are usually, however, they're not, sometimes they are single-sided. Um, sometimes though they are a, she a sheet of paper just that's folded in two, but the inside and the back will be left blank. It's only the front that has any any graphic imagery on it or any text usually, any printed text that is. Um, the sentimental varieties though are much, are, are very adventurous um, and they can use very costly materials. Um, uh, many would use different types of fabric. So uh, one of the examples we looked at there, uh, which was the from the Wood um, web collection um, has, uh, I think, 
um, a silk, a blue silk bow on it. Um, so ribbons would be used, pieces of fabric might be used to kind of raise the level. Um, Rimmel started producing kind of perfume sachets that were inserted into Valentine's so that they smelled sweet. Um, and um, yes, different kinds of fabric, especially kind of gauze um, and potentially sometimes lace as well. Um, as they became more ornate, uh, that the types of material used would, would become very adventurous. So um, there's a couple of examples in the Museum of London archive um, where there are some dead birds on the Valentines, uh, kind of taxidermied birds. I'm not sure why a canary says I love you, but apparently um, it did to somebody. Um, and lots of things um, get inserted. So a crushed glass could be used to create a kind of sparkly effect. Um, so yes, they, they, the ornate sentimental versions um, moved well beyond paper, although paper, especially lace and embossed paper was still often the base, um, even in some of the 3D versions or the boxed Valentines, sprung Valentines. And I'll just add, and you saw this Valentines, well, um, human hair, you know, uh, you know, some folks oh, here, you yes. know, like human hair that's used mm -hmm. in, often you see it, you know, um, kind of um, braided together and, and in friendship albums, but yes, we, we do have one that has hair. Yes, I wanted uh, to that. a token. I it in my photos. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, it's a wonderful example. I think the use of hair is another way in which these are, these are objects that can be personalized, um, and yes, that use of hair um, kind of it seems to give it that personal touch um, because it becomes much more of a kind of um, a, a token for, for memory, a kind of form yeah. of remembrance. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. A, a physical part of, of, of a person. Yeah. Um, I have a couple. I'm hoping we have a, a few more questions. I think it is 235. It's usually our end time. I'm going to push it a little bit. Um, uh, going to combine a couple questions. Um, fantastic talk. You mentioned these cards emerge as a form of middle class communication as such. Do you have a sense of how expensive these cards were? And could the card giver show their socioeconomic status through card choice and quality? Would the receiver reject a suitor based off the card choice? Was there any equivalent for the working or lower <laughs> classes? And did they cover similar themes? And um, somewhat related question, um, to what extent did African Americans um, participate in the design, manufacturing, and distribution of Valentine's in this time period? Um, yeah, I'm going to take that question first, because that's something that I've been interested in as well. And I found it very difficult um, to try to establish. Um, there doesn't seem to be much record. Um, I did come across um, one newspaper article um, that mentioned uh, an African-American girl had asked for... Um, Black Valentines, and there was no response to it. There was no kind of, you know, well, it, it, there wasn't anything further. Um, so um, having said that, um, the Wood Webb um, family um, have a really great, huge uh, volume of material that um, exists in the Library Company of Philadelphia, a prominent African-American family in Philadelphia. Um, and that includes um, cards that I, I would call Valentines. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, uh, illustration, illustrated um, sort of friendship, um, can't think of the right word. Um, almost like a sort of friendship album. Um, I recall looking at, um, but so my answer there would be, it seems to be harder to establish um, than I had thought. And I need to look in much more detail at that as a question. On, uh, on the question of class and cost, um, Valentines would really range in cost. They, they were very, at the lower end, they were very inexpensive. So therefore they were very accessible. And especially in the Civil War, um, uh, certain stationers would actually um, uh, sell packets of Civil War Valentines to soldiers um, uh, for, for really reduced cost. 
um, all the way up to the very, very expensive ones. But you could also buy Valentines in sets, like we would buy Christmas cards uh, in, in, in our own society. So um, not necessarily intending to send one to just one person. Um, you could choose to buy um, a series so that you could send multiple Valentines. Um, I mentioned at the end of the talk as well, Valentine writers, um, which while some of the verses inside Valentine writers may be addressed to a lady or a gentleman, uh, many Valentine writers do seem to be really geared towards the working classes because they have, uh, primarily they are um, uh, addressed to an individual through their trade. Um, so you will often have, I don't know, a mantua maker to a chambermaid um, or, you know, a, a, a tallow chandler um, or a sailor. So uh, that happens quite a lot, which might suggest that Valentine writers as initially, so late 18th and early 19th century, um, may have been kind of deliberately catering for that market, perhaps on the assumption that without, um, that they may have less access um, to, um, I don't know, you know, poetry anthologies or something like that, where they could um, transcribe a poem into their own Valentine. This would be a cheap alternative. Great. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. There's one final question, which I think could be your final <laughs> remark as we say thank you to everyone who attended um, this um, a talk. It, uh, it, I, I, I learned things, uh, which you know you always <laughs> want um, from these kinds of experience. I hope those in the audience as well. And um, so thank you. And so the last question will be the last words from you, Alice, is um, heard you were, you know, that you were working on a book. When do you think this may be available for purchase? Oh, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, in uh i would say um academic <laughs> academic books books have a very long lead in time so i would realistically be saying not until 2025 um i've been lucky enough to just secure a, a, a sabbatical uh, a, a semester of um, research leave um which is the beginning of 2025 so that is the point at which i will be completing the book and submitting it and then it will be going through the publication process um but uh, please do buy it when it comes out. Um, and if anyone would like to get in touch, um, I'm always happy to talk about Valentine's and similar paper ephemera. Um, so uh, please, please do reach out if this is something that you're interested in or you'd like to discuss it further. Great. I know you said last word. Thank you again, everyone, for attending this afternoon. Thank you, Alice, and everyone have a good um, early um, evening. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.